Inner Quest explores various pathways through which you can connect with the infinite wisdom of the universe and apply it to personal, professional, and spiritual growth. This program featuring accomplished practitioners, educators, and authors is provided by Infinity Foundation, an innovative center for holistic studies and research. We invite you to share this journey with us. Hello, welcome to InterQuest. My name is Jay Stone, your host for today, and our guest is Allison Sutter. Hey, nice to be here. It's, it's, did I miss? I, did, nope, it's good. Okay. We're good. All right. Uh, Allison is using her master's in education to teach spirituality. She blends and makes spirituality and practical self help relevant to daily life. Allison's digital courses serve students in over 30 countries, and Allison is holding the book accelerate your mojo that she wrote so uh, let's start by the premise of your book or your title of your book accelerate your mojo tell our audience what it is about sure well accelerate doesn't mean go faster typically that's what is implied by that word what I mean is realize something sooner realization is very different from speed mojo is that connection to infinite intelligence that every single person has. So is it our mojo or uh, uh, mojo that's cosmic or Wait, belongs well, to nature Well, your mojo is God. cosmic, right? I mean, yeah. we're connected to all that is. And so by connecting to the spiritual aspect that is us, mm -hmm. we can connect with infinite intelligence and solve problems faster, you know, um, feel better, realize things sooner than we normally would have. Okay. So. And uh, later we're going to talk about the seven techniques sure. to accelerate your mojo. Um, what kind of people are drawn to ex the accelerate your mojo process? Well, in the book, so typically what I like to do as a teacher is give people solid things to go to. So in the book, there's a self-assessment. And in the self-assessment, somebody can come to this and self-identify immediately if this work is for them because I don't like to waste people's time. So well, and and yeah. so they're assessing. What exactly are they? What are your potential readers or students assessing? Well, they're assessing whether this book is this work is right for them. So people that are struggling to mm. make decisions, people that are have feel like fear and doubt are stopping them from having the life experiences that they want. But there are 15 of these, and they all deal with inner you know, kinds of explorations, inner quests, so figuring fit, out. Okay, so what would be a, a typical question or inner quest? Well, I'll tell you. So they come and they read these and they say, I experience skepticism or emotional discomfort even when things are going great in life. And if that's something they say themselves, yes, that's me, then this is appropriate for them. They don't okay. even have to read the whole book. I mean, they know right away whether it's good for them or not. And so somebody with the skepticism that expects to proverbial shoe to drop, uh, what are they going to start to experience after, or as they go through the course and finish the process? Well, so this book is about realizing our spiritual source. And in realizing your spiritual source first, you can use that information to dispel the skepticism over time. Mm -hmm. Not immediately, nothing happens overnight. Mm -hmm. But over time, they can learn to use their emotional guidance system to help them navigate the problems and challenges in life. So they don't you know, stay upset or confused for months on end. Maybe mm -hmm. they can know they're feeling that way and then go through the system and figure out how to get out of it sooner. Okay. Um, accelerate your mojo. Uh, let's see. Oh, initiates what kind of transformations? So well, again, so the transformations are just a flip of the self-assessment. So they can begin to recognize when they're feeling skeptic or fearful or doubtful, transform that into something that feels better sooner. Because I don't believe we're supposed to get rid of fear or live fearlessly. It's supposed to be a navigational system mm -hmm. to help us. And so they can transform that. They don't just stay stuck. And so problems and challenges don't look so bad, you know? Now, do, uh, since there's a, it sounds like there's a lot of inner work, Mm -hmm. uh, it, do you recommend meditation, journaling? So 
A lot of my work is teaching people how to use their inner guidance to make decisions. Mm -hmm. So I'm all about helping my students not look for exterior guidance, but learn how to access their inner guidance to know what the next best step is. That being said, I do have a couple of recommendations, you know, like meditation. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it's about knowing what's right for you and not using the outside source as the reason to make a choice. Well, it sounds to me a lot like people <clears throat> using their instincts and intuition more. Yeah, lining up or with Or self-preservation skills or well, yeah, self-evolving skills. Because you can take advice from other people till the cows come home, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right next step for you to follow that external you know, advice. How, and how did you uh, <clears throat> come to write this book? Well, I myself was struggling with the 15 self-assessment things, and I was looking towards personal development, and I was looking toward spirituality, but these two isolated topics weren't giving me a uh, resolution for these things. And so I took the two and I put them together and I found how to utilize this inner guidance to solve practical everyday solutions. So I, you know, I wrote it for me, I wrote it for my girls, I wrote it for anybody who benefits from it. Mm -hmm. And how many years ago are we talking about? Oh, well, probably about, I started about four years ago, five years ago, sort of like things aren't working for me. I was still feeling fearful and doubtful and, you know, the things that most people wrestle with. And then mm -hmm. I said, you know, what if I, and I took my education background. I said, it's got to be logical. It's got to be sort of, there have to be steps so people can follow them. Mm -hmm. um, but I also want to take the spiritual and the practical and sort of blend them into a, you know, a, a system that we can work with. And so what are examples of uh, the practical that you blend in with the spirituality. Well, if you go, if you dive into self help, you know um, they have a lot of practical. They give you actions to do a lot of practical things like meditation or like set goals or like um, you know get up at five a.m. or all the things that they like to set. If you do this, this will happen. But I don't recommend uh, people. I recommend people go inward, take what feels best for them, so that they can solve like relationship issues. Mm -hmm. find health solutions, financial solutions, you know, whatever they're facing in their daily life that's challenging for them. And uh, what age is, what age could someone start work on, working on accelerating? Any age, frankly. I mean, it's not, the part, my work isn't like demographic based. It isn't like a woman who's 45 who makes this much money and lives in this area. It's more, that's what the self-assessment is. It's like, do you struggle with doubt and fear? I use it with my kids. My kids are 11, 13, and 15, and we mm. use these strategies to face, you know, issues with kids at school or, mm. you know, things that we deal with as people who are interfacing every day and, you know. Is, is uh, part of your program uh, positive goal setting? So I'm not much of a goal setter. I did goal setting for a long time, but I realized that goal setting wasn't working for me. So that's why I went into this because it's not about, part of one of the steps is called ask, but it's not about setting an external goal and setting a date. It's more about getting in touch with what it is you want to ask for as an experience in life and then emotionally lining up with it. So that's step one. Um, instead of just, a lot of times though, when we set goals, I think we set goals that other people want for us. They aren't really our goals. Mm -hmm. um, and, I've, and a lot of feedback I got for, you know, in the communities that I was working with, with goal setting, there's a lot of failure involved. You set these goals and it doesn't work at a certain time and people feel bad and... Well, to, uh, to, to the point, you know, Thomas Edison was asked, well, you feel like a failure because you tried to make a light bulb 10,000 times and failed. He says, no, I now know 10,000 ways not to make a light bulb. You yeah, know? I mean, it's about the experience of it, not yeah. the end result. It's the path that's the most important. But all those times uh, Edison failed to make a light bulb, it never deterred, uh, deterred him. No, because he was, well, the reason internal, it didn't. Internal, internally driven. Well, it was the experience he was looking for. It's the, the manipulation of the experience and finding the right thing. So finding the right thing is sort of like icing on the cake. All right, now there's seven steps mm -hmm. uh, to accelerating your mojo. You want to lead us through the seven sure. steps? And I would like to show you if we can, because I think sometimes visually it's helpful to see this stuff. Okay. So I'll hold this up and see if we can focus on it quickly. 
So, so it's there are the living, seven steps. Living 360 framework of Accelerate mm -hmm. Mojo, living a fulfilling life right. experience. Right, so these steps, um, I'm going to pull them down now so I can just, they are cyclical. So you can use these seven steps, you can recycle them in mm. different experiences. The first step is to ask for what you want, different from goal setting. And a a ask for what you want. At, so you're sort of universally asking, or maybe you're physically asking. I think a lot of people need to ask for help when they need it. Yeah. Uh, can you give an example <laughs> of uh, some of the questions like some of your students or children may have asked? They may be asking for better health. Like I particularly asked for a release of migraines for many years, and it took mm -hmm. me 10 years to find ultimately find my resolution, which I found. Um, but it could be a particular health resolution, or it mm -hmm. could be a relationship resolution. One student is looking and she's very new to the process and she's still looking to me as the teacher to tell her what to do and I'm you know helping her understand that inward um, is the place to find the ideal solution for this relationship struggle. You know she's like do I stay? Do I go? And so I'm sort of closing my mouth and asking her to turn inward and showing her how to do that to ask mm. her spirit and source how to find the resolution and how to take action on it. Mm -hmm. So that's step one. So you emotionally align with that, which is difficult for a lot of people. And then step two is desire. So desire has gotten a bad rap. If you listen to pop culture, if you listen to a lot of the way people talk about it, when they think about what they want, they think desire is bad. Like, I shouldn't desire that. Or the idea of desire feels bad. So we're, we're saying no, well, no, no. What are people desiring that is bad or are good. Well, women typically have sometimes been like, if I desire something better, it, there's a sense of guilt associated with wanting something better. Mm -hmm. You know, so what I'm saying is the aspect of desiring something is a positive human trait. Mm -hmm. So let's celebrate that and let's let's figure out when we're thinking about what we ask for, do we feel good or do we feel bad, really? Mm -hmm. you know, we're just some cognitive awareness here, some emotional awareness um, is really what you want. So. Um, we're, we're acknowledging that desire feels good, and it should feel good. And, um, and do uh, <clears throat> your students and yourself actually feel the desire in, in their body? Yes, it's, okay. a, it's a visceral sensation, because all emotions are visceral sensations. Whether you hate somebody or you love somebody, there's a visceral sensation involved. I, I agree, yeah. uh, but you know, getting back to that woman who was trying to figure out her relationship, yeah. Uh, desire waxes and wanes, you know, some, some of the time I'm sure, you know, she, that, that person she was involved with, it just feels she has desire for him or her and other times. Not that way though. What I'm talking about is desire for a healthy relationship, not necessarily for that person, but the aspect of wanting, because we all want healthy relationships. But that's what I'm talking about. Not necessarily the desire for a physical person. I think person, most people don't even know what a healthy relationship is. Well, you, know. you can find that's so part of this is asking questions. All that out. You know, what is yeah. health for me? Yeah, you exactly. Know, yeah, I like the part with the question because that creates what's called a transderivational search. Yeah. Which uh, we we'll, can talk about later. Yeah, you got to ask the questions. Yeah. Um, three is a big one. Too big for a small 20, 30 minute show but it's belief and it's understanding how belief creates the fabric, literally this experience, every experience of our lives. Mm -hmm. So that's a big one because a lot of people have been trained to think affirmations are the way to go and intellect is the way to go. If I think about what I want in a positive light, I'm supposed to get it. But beliefs are vibrational because we're spiritual vibrational beings and we can feel one way and think another. That's how gifted we are as humans. So that's a whole topic that sort of is slow. Well, how does one change uh, <clears throat> his or her belief system? Well, you have to know what they, you have to kind of know how you feel because we're vibrational beings and belief is identified through emotion, the emotional resonance. And then it's identified through the context of a person's life, what they're living, their relationships, their health. So it's a, it's a slow cooking kind of process. Um, but I can tell you when you change a belief 
and usually the negative ones are the only ones people want to change. They want to keep the positive ones, right? They're good. Well, I, I know what's going on right now. The anti-Trumpers want to change the beliefs of the Trumpers, and well, the Trumpers want to change the yes, beliefs of the Yes, but you can't change other people's beliefs, so you, know, so yeah. you need to deal with your own. Yeah. But, well, and you, what usually happens is, for for the uh, uh, peace and serenity, you don't talk about it. We don't talk about it. So, but yeah. this is like, we're going to stay away from politics and just gear towards the intimate details of a person's life. But when they change a belief, mm -hmm. the old belief will appear illogical. So the easiest way to think about that is to think about the things that you thought about in elementary or middle school, how you believe the world to be. And when you get older, you change your perspective. Well, it's a worldview. The psychologists called it a world a worldview. But just just say like you know. Um, the world is good. The world was bad. The world is any belief. But when confused. you look back on like, or I'll be friends with this person forever. Like you and this belief. You think when you're in middle school, you're going to be best friends with that person forever. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. But if you change your beliefs and you look back on them. The old will belief will appear illogical, like I'm a bad person. Like if a person has a belief that is looking upon themselves negatively and they're harmonic with it, it won't appear illogical. It will be, be completely logical to them. But then when they change it and they look back on that, they'll say, I can't believe I ever thought I was really a bad person because it will appear illogical. Well, um I'll, I'll use myself as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was younger, I just ate cruddy food, unhealthy food. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it uh, had an adverse effect on my mind, mm -hmm. adverse effect on my body, adverse effect on my relationships sure. because my mind and body were <coughs> out of sorts mm -hmm. or out of kilter. So, but at that time, I, I, I don't really think I had any belief about food other than just shovel it in. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, say, as a te late teens, early 20s, you know, the light bulb went off. And, right. you know, we are what we eat. Right. So you changed and, your belief, and it seemed illogical that shoveling in, you well, know. Well, it didn't seem illogical. I didn't, it wasn't logical or illogical. It just didn't, a belief didn't exist. Well, it does. Bel there, it does. But you may not recognize it necessarily because we're motivated through belief systems. That's how we make all the movements that we make every single day. You know, if I believe exercise is good for me, then I'm probably going to make a motivation to exercise. If I think it doesn't affect me, probably not going to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it affects everything that we do. Um, want me to keep going? Sure. We're on four now. Four. We're on four. So yeah. four is to allow in the things that we're asking for in one, that we're checking in with our desire in two, and we're adjusting our beliefs for in three. So we're either, most humans are very resistant to really the good that they asked for. And it's, mm -hmm. that seems almost illogical, but it's how a lot of people feel because you can listen to the way they speak. They go, I don't deserve that, or I will never have that, or that's not possible for me. You know, the language is identifying. Yeah, it's called guilt beating, mm -hmm. where people beat up on themselves. And they don't allow the good they've asked for to actually be receptive. Mm -hmm. or received by them. So, well, if they're making those statements, how could it's, any good really get through that? It's not going to come through. So yeah. part of the practice is identifying statements when you make them, knowing you're being sort of, you know, holding it apart from you, and then shifting that over time. Now, uh, do you go through uh, the steps all at once in a day? Uh, is God, no. Of, no, no, no. Um, the class that I'm working with right now we're working for three months, and we're, go we're taking one topic per class, per call. Um, and students might make a little bit of progress. So I hear uh, per call. Mm -hmm. So people call up, and you're teaching a class? I have a class, and we can speak and see each other. You know, we can see. Like th through the computer or something? Yeah, through the computer. OK. So oh, so that's the digital class. Yeah. Duh. Right, right. <laughs> so, um, but. What I'm a big um, believer in is relaxing about things having to change like this. We are so focused on speed, we need to just stop and relax and slow down and just be a little more comfortable 
with things happening over time. So uh, how far into this, was it, did you say three month class? Uh, this group in particular is a three month group. Okay. I have them ongoing with how, this particular how, group. how far into the three month class are you? Third call, so three weeks, three, three okay. weeks, yeah. And so where, where are you at with your your process still in step one or? We're in the third call, in fact, we're having the third call after this. So we're on the third call. And so what we're looking for are micro realizations, not massive ones. We're not looking to change overnight. We're just looking for small awarenesses. And like one of the students um, on the last call started to um, talk about her story. I always absorb negative energies of other people. When I'm with a client who's the wrong client, I feel drained. And so she went on with her story. And then afterwards, I just said, OK, so I want you to play this back. And I want you to listen to the story you just told from the perspective of a loving friend or a mom listening to a daughter who she just adores. And I want you to hear the story because you know, we're telling ourselves these stories, which are belief systems. Um, and if it's not helping you, you want to change it, mm -hmm. you know, because you don't want to be drained. So uh, is your students like a support group? Um, it's an educational group where it's, it's, we're looking to shift the way we're interacting with our reality, mm -hmm. right? We want more of the good and less of the negative. Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm big on awareness, on growing awareness, on um, I did a lot of educational study onto like, you know, the quantum physics, the sort of, sort of side where um, physicists are looking at, um, you know, uh, life timelines and different. So I wanted to understand the physics behind it from what I could because. Oh, I could tell you about that. Spirituality okay. makes more sense when you kind of understand it from a physics standpoint. Mm -hmm. So I'll drop in bits of information that the students well, want that just are educational. What, what you mentioned timeline actually physicists have put a arrow at the end of the timeline to show that time is infinite mm -hmm. and it's not just on one side for the future but you could the also past. go go the past yeah. as well uh-huh so, so understanding that kind of stuff is beneficial for the students too so they can expand their awareness and grow their understanding and well when you get into modern day physics though when you make a leap it's a quantum leap you either leap to the next level up or you leap to the next level down there's no in between just like a population of a city can only go up by one person mm -hmm. if a new right. child is born or mm -hmm. down by a person if someone passes away mm -hmm. so yeah so even so this is where we blend in the spiritual these concepts that sometimes are nebulous and sort of hard to grasp like what do i do with that when i'm arguing with my daughter in the kitchen or when i you know have a financial crisis so we're bringing that stuff in and rolling it in so you can use it to solve your problems, which is what you want to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's what we're doing. So fifth is focus of attention. Okay. So we're talking both the mental focus where you can sort of get an idea of what you're thinking about, but also an emotional focus. I think of it like a beam of light. There's an energy that's um, sort of an emotional focus and there's the intel and just playing with where am I thinking and where am I feeling? Mm -hmm. Are they coherent? Are they incoherent? What am I you know, seeing in comparison to what I'm thinking about and what I'm feeling? So big awareness step there. Um, six is inspired action. So, uh, but what are you putting your focus and intention on? Is it just where you at, at at each and every moment? Just being fully present? or uh, you know, being in the now, the power of the now? Depends on so what you can, each student is different. So some students can be more present over, mm -hmm. over you know, five or six years, seven years, I've become to be more, learn how to be more present in the moment. Sometimes it spins out on you. And mm -hmm. so just knowing what's happening and seeing the correlation is beneficial. You know, okay. it's not always necessarily being in the moment of now, although you are in the moment of now, but your head can go past, present, future, you know, just knowing where you're going. Well, I, I know this from my own experience and maybe from observing others is that when I make mistakes or have problems or uh, do errors, my focus and intention is low. Well, it's just <laughs> somewhere else. Well, it's, it's there, but it's probably just not where you want it to be. It's in the negative. Yeah. It's okay. It's all right, yeah. you know, it's sort of like, don't beat yourself up. It's okay, no big deal. Okay. And um, 
inspired action is different from action for me, is the way we're defining it, because I define action as that stuff you think you should do. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I should do this. If I do this, I'll have this result. Or if I, you know, if I follow the instructions, then I'll have this result. Versus inspired action is a dialogue between you and your higher self. And mm -hmm. it knows the, the most accelerated path to get to either the inner or outer realization you want. Now, you mentioned a, a dialogue with the higher mm -hmm. self. So that involves the inner voice. But what about the feelings during uh, this that step. is the inner voice. I don't, I don't trust, I don't, well, not, I don't instruct my students to follow the constant chatter. In, mm -hmm. Intuition is a, is a sensation. It's not a voice. Well, I, I would, there's intuitive it. thoughts and there's intuitive feelings. So, so from my perspective, <laughs> what we're coming from is a spiritual energy, a non-physical being, a consciousness that comes into physical perspective, which focuses here, and then the way I'm asking students to look at it, and they can take what I'm saying with a grain of salt or to throw it out completely, it's up to them. But the first symptomology is a feeling. And then the feeling will sort of turn into something. And this is like so fast. The so symptomology fast. mean problems begin with a feeling? No, sim symptoms, meaning like it's symptom is just a, a um, data, okay. right? So like in the body, um, I read a book where the, the medical um, a holistic health practitioner was saying that like a rash would be three-fourths of the way along the disease process. So that indicator would tell you, like just from a certain like a steps perspective, like one-fourth, two-fourths, three-fourths. So we're looking at this from like a, um, from sort of like a step perspective. Like feelings come first in my opinion mm -hmm. and then but what if somebody has ahedona or lexthymia? Say that again? <laughs> ahedona is the inability to feel feelings, and lexthymia is the ability, inability to express feelings. So somebody could uh, feel feelings, but they can't explain them to other people. Well, I would refer them to a professional. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is not something that I would, you know, am trained to deal with. I would okay. say you need to see a professional. Okay. That's what I would say. Yeah, we've got about a minute and a half. Okay. So did we get through all seven steps? Um, detached optimism was the last one, and that's just being able to look forward without having your teeth in something you think should happen, you know, exactly the way it's being open to letting it happen as it's going and, to happen. And uh, can we experience detached optimism on a daily basis? Absolutely. Regular basis? Absolutely. Once you learn to just look forward with optimism for the miracles, and not necessarily the particulars, like it has to happen this way. You're so much, you're so much more joyful. All right, well, we've got about 45 seconds. Please use that time to say anything you want about your book, your digital services, uh, et cetera. Well, I would say if a person wants to, you know, pick out the book and, you know, take a look at it, I would first ask them to go to the self-assessment because I wouldn't want them to, you know, go into the whole book and then be like, oh, it's not for me. So can, can people do the self-assessment without buying the book? Absolutely. They mm -hmm. would have to go through me, but um, you can do that for free. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and typically, how much time does it take one to do a self-assessment? Um, 30 seconds. 30 <laughs> seconds. Wow. How fast can you read 15 questions? I mean, an All right. And, I got to wrap up. Uh, <laughs> for more information about uh, uh, Allison Sutter, and the Infinity Foundation or Quest Show. Stay tuned to the crits at the end. Until next time, wish you good health, good fortune, and good spirits. Elson, it was a pleasure to meet you. For more information about this show, our guest, Infinity Foundation, or any of our other programs, please visit our website, infinityfoundation.org, or call us at 847-831-8828.